Good morning and welcome to the ZP Developer Zone. So we like to do this live every um, Thursday 8am London time. But today, unfortunately, um, I'm actually in Paris um, and in a hotel and the Wi-Fi is really not um, super good. So unfortunately, this is going to have to be a, um, a recorded version. So, but let me dive into it anyway. Um, the first thing is that obviously we, you know, we have our ZP Academy. So if you have technical questions around electrochemistry, don't forget to look at that. We have these webinars every Thursday. We do have collaborations. Now these collaborations are sort of, you know, people reach out to us for collaborations. They're strictly speaking with academia. Um, and you know, we, we have different engagements with commercial. Um, we obviously promote jobs and we also have our developer zone and we have our workshops. Um, so I did mention that um, today I'm actually recording this and having to upload it because of the bandwidth. And the reason being is we've just done a workshop in Grenoble. Um, so that's now brought me from Grenoble to Paris and hence in this hotel and hence the bad um, bandwidth. It's probably worth saying that we do have a lot of workshops um, in 2023 and I will be posting lots of workshops over the sort of hollow holiday period. Um, so... There probably will be a workshop near you in 2023 or come to us if you want. Um, so, and any link that I, that you see today, I will also, um, put underneath the video as well when I post it. So some questions, um, somebody's struggling with some electronics for hydroponics. So I'll just touch upon that. Somebody else was asking about, um, building a potential stat. Um, they said specifically Arduino. So, um, I will touch upon that. Sensors for agriculture and cotton growing. There's a lot of people, a lot of software companies these days, which are really IoT, Internet of Things companies. Um, and I'll talk about our ZP solutions for those. Um, sensors for prior date um, detection. I'll talk about that. Sensors for copper in environmental samples. I'll talk about that. I'll also talk about design of experiments. And I'll also talk about um, heavy metal detection as well. That was the last question that came in. Somebody was asking, did they have sensors for heavy metal? Were they, um, did they have mercury in them? Which is an unusual question because obviously, you know, that would really be a problem. But anyway, I'll touch upon that. Um, so we have had this long running um, this discussion about um, sensors for hydroponics. Um, so at ZP, we do have a whole bunch of um, iron selective electrodes. We do talk about iron selective electrodes at um, our ZP workshop. It's probably also worth saying that everyone now who comes to the ZP workshop, um, they make and test um, biosensors like glucose sensors, but they also test pH sensors. So if you want to see one of our pH sensors in operation and see like everyone in the room make it work, then um, come to one of our workshops. Um, so we will support a ZP our own electronics, um, but this person is struggling because um, they've sent us the data um, yeah, the data is kind of really not what we would expect. Um, so they're using our sensor, but they're not using our electronics. Um, so one of the things that's to say is that the reason that we have electronics at ZP is because what we find is that um, when you solve, let's say, one problem, and the first problem that we solved at ZP was there were no um, readily access to biosensors basically then we solve that problem the next problem that we then ran into is lots of people actually struggle with the electronics which is a bit surprising to us but anyway it happened so that's why we then um, went on to actually design our own electronics and um, so it's not the first time that we've had um, people struggling on the electronics front there's basically two types there's people who build their own electronics and there's people who build um, who we just use potential stats and so people who use potential stats they generally have no problems, or if they use our electronics, they have no problems. But when you build your own electronic, um, we do have a few problems. The first question to ask somebody if they're building electronics is, do you have a reference instrument? I mean, I'll list some reference instruments at the moment because obviously if you're building something and you're, it, it's good to have something to be able to compare it against. So a reference instrument is always useful um, because that, that actually allows you to then troubleshoot whether the problems with the sensor, the application, or the electronics. So in this case, I mean, you know, we use these sensors all the time, especially the pH one. Um, so this is this um, a couple of things here. They say very, very clearly, and I'll touch upon this in their notes, that they're using our reference and our working electrode. 
But I've said it last week and I have to say it again. If that is the case, it was, there'll be a better image in a minute. You are oxidizing the counter electrode. So you're, what you write and what is happening are two different things. It says you are using the reference of working, but the images you send say something else. It say you're oxidizing the counter electrode. You really got to look at that. Um, we do understand how you're testing it. It's completely fine. This is the way we would test it as well. You know, immersing in a beaker about halfway is completely fine. So that's not an issue. But I said it before, the electrodes are telling us something. When you look at the electrodes, you've got a lot of oxidation on the counter electrode. And I showed this to an engineer. We were having a conversation about your electronics, your schematics. First thing he said is, oh, they're oxidizing the counter electrode. They must be putting current through it or a voltage on it. I said, no. Well, they, they say no, but they are. Um, so you should be um, attaching that. That's the working electrode. And attaching that, that's the reference electrode. But actually, the oxidation on that counter tells me it's okay. I mean, your connection, your connector, where do you think you're probably connecting your reference to the wrong pin? Not the world's biggest issue, but just want to let you know that that's what's happening. Um, so we did take a look at the circuits. Um, so obviously connect the working electrode here and connect um, the reference out on that um, guard ring, as you call it. Um, you know, we looked at the voltage divider because you're obviously adding a voltage. We didn't have a big issue with it. It's not something that we've done. So first things first, it's not something that we regularly do. So that is different from what we would potentially do. You have an amplifier here, no issues. One of the things that was concerning us was we couldn't, we, we didn't really know what this pH1 ADC offset was. Um, so we think that maybe you've got fluctuation on your reference. So um, we think that your reference is fluctuating the electronics on the reference are fluctuating. In general, we think these electronics look fine. But of course, the devil's in the detail, you know, choosing the op amp, balancing all these resistors um, and capacitors. You know, this is not our circuit, this is your circuit, so we haven't done it. Um, you know, we haven't got a big issue with it, but we do think that your noise, essentially, that is because you've got a fluctuation in your reference electrode. Sometimes your reference electrode's here, sometimes it's here, sometimes it's here, and that's what's causing. So I think you've got a problem with your ref, with a rep, with what you're applying on your reference pin. But I also would, I have said it already, but you are putting a voltage and or current onto that counter electrode, which you say is not in the circuit. And actually there's so much voltage and current flowing on it, you are oxidizing it, which is you know, it's just not what's intended. So um, we've looked at the circuit. We can't, you know, we, we would have to build it to really, to really be able to critique it correctly. But um, in general, we think it's okay. I mean, this is a circuit, um, again, that we've built in the past. Um, we don't support this circuit. This is something that we just did once upon a time. It was about 2017, you know, but this worked for us, but it has similar sort of elements to the one that you have. Um, so we can't absolutely say what's wrong with your circuit. And there's a link here, um, which will sort of, that now we do not support this web page in here anymore. We leave it up there for, to help the community, but it's not something that we absolutely support. We do not. But we did see some, it had some elements that you have, um, but we were a bit concerned about what's happening on your reference electrode. Now, I did mention reference instruments. You do have to, sometimes when you're, if, in general, if you're developing a biosensing system, then you have at least two parts, a sensor and electronics. You do need reference instruments to test sensors upon um, in, so that when you're developing your electronics, you can kind of know what the, I wouldn't call any of these the gold standard, but you know, there's a whole bunch of instruments that we use or have used in the past. Um, and finally, if you really are struggling, um, you have to come to one of our workshops and talk to the engineers and see these sensors in action there. And here's a whole bunch of links to reference instruments. Because um, then when you've got a reference instrument, you can say, oh, it's the sensor. But actually, you'll find out the sensor's fine and it's the electronics that's the problem. But we have had a look at the electronics. We don't have a big crit critique on them. Um, but I did mention that obviously you are frying that counter electrode, which you say is not in circuit, but it is in circuit. Um, building a potentiostat. 
um, the inquiry here um, you know, is very clued up. They do understand that actually we do have um, quite a page on this stuff. So they were do asking, but that if I pick in on the inquiry specifically, they're asking um, about Arduino. They say, you know, how do I build a potential stack, for example, using Arduino? Um, we do have a page on that on open source potential stats and um, specifically there's a button there for Arduino, but I think the inquirer already knows. So the inquirer has looked at the website. They've, you know, they've referenced this page and they say, well, you know, we want to know how to do it from an Arduino. Um, we haven't built potential stats from Arduino. We've built potentiometers using Arduinos, but not potential stat. But when I took a look at that Arduino button, this isn't, you know, that paper that this links to is all discusses Arduino all the way through. So at Zimmer and Peacock, we um, to teach somebody to make an, a potential stat is, you know, it's a sort of master's project. We have lots of guys who um, follow us on YouTube, for example. Some of them are really good electronic engineers, and they, they build potential stats as part of master's project. So it is a bit hard to sit here and to describe how to build potential stats. Um, but specifically with Arduino, we do have links on the website on how to do that. Um, and I did want to say that when I looked at that paper, um, actually, this is from that paper, you know, they quite clearly show that actually how to do um, linear sweep voltammetry or cyclovoltammetry on that paper. And I just want to say that the inquirer is saying, oh, well, you know, should I test with ferricyanide? Don't test potential stats with, with chemistry. Test them with known components. So in this paper, they test with a, um, with a one kilo ohm resistor. So, you know, when developing electronics, it's not a good idea to necessarily test your electronics using um, uh, biosensors. We actually test our electronics using little, what we call dummy cells, which are little sort of circuits, even just elements like a resistor or capacitor. But, you know, using chemistry to test electronics that's under the development is not a good idea. You've got too much going on liquids, chemistry, and you're trying to develop electronics. No, we use what we call dummy cells. We do have something called validation sensors, which is probably taking a worth taking a look at on our website um, as well. Um, so I hope um, specifically to the question, how do I build a potential stat using Arduino? We do have it on the website. And I just wanted to sort of say to you, um, you know, whether you use a 10 bit ADC or a 12 bit ADC is a bit of a choice. They did ask, do they think steps of 50 millivolts was sufficient? I think I would say actually steps more like one millivolt is probably better. 50 millivolts seems a bit um, bit of a big step when you're doing a, 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 voltam a voltammetry experiment. And then lastly, don't test your electronics on ferrocyanide. I test them with known resistors. Um, you can test with ferrocyanide when you when you when you when you can. Um, get a rational result out of a known resistor, then you can go into the test with things like ferrocyanide. Um, a lot of the electroanalytical techniques are obviously all covered in our workshop. So I would suggest, um, you know, if you really want to build potential stats, um, we do hold these workshops in India as well. It's probably worth re reaching out to Technando about that. Um, question number three, there's a lot of um, companies these days, especially software companies that are now IoT, Internet of Things companies, people want to measure um, in this case they want to run fertilizer runoff it's a kind of an environmental um, question um, and at zp we do have um, a whole stack of technologies that are suitable for iot companies everything that we do you know whether it's discrete measurements and here i'm sure discrete measurement where you take a sample you read it once um, and even in that technology stack, we definitely have an API policy, an application program interface policy. So any software companies out there, any IoT companies, any consultants, ZP has a technology stack of sensors, electronics, connectivity to the cloud. Um, we process the raw data into information in the cloud, and then we can pass it on to um, third party dashboards and software using an API call. So this is really part of our sort of whole strategy around industry 4.0. You know, you could call it agriculture 4.0, lab 4.0, but this is really just the idea that software or cloud systems are talking to each other really through um, an API. 
And so at ZP, when we first started, we did see there was a big gap, let's say, in the Internet of Things, which is actually all these buyer sensors. So um, software companies can now sort of plug that gap in buyer sensors. And they, it's the easiest thing they can do is actually just plug straight into our API, our application program interface, which is intrinsic to Judy. So Judy can acquire data through our hardware and through third party systems. We can store the data, we can process the data, we can visualize the data in Julie. But then I think with a lot of these applications, people actually want to see, they want to see the data in their dashboard, and that's an API call um, upon um, Julie. It's not just um, discrete measurements, it's also continuous measurements as well. So we do have the ability, um, I've got a link here, those links will be useful to people. Um, of sensors that can be an environmental type applications and send the data to the cloud. So Zimmer, Zimmer Peacock, for the IoT firms out there, we're a sensor to API um, company. To engage with us, I think the smallest engagement has to be a micro project. Um, I've got some links to that. Uh, mini projects scale up from there and then proof of concept. We can do lots of good work in a proof of concept, but a really lowest grade of or lowest um, level of engagement is what we call a micro project. Um, with us at ZP. This is really an industry 4.0 um, application. People are very interested in cleaning um, screens, stereography, thick film printing, screen printing. Um, people use screens and people need to clean these screens. Um, and they use very um, strong oxidizing materials like pyridate. But the question is, is how much pyridate is in that wash solution? So that's a really good in industry 4.0 question because, you know, it's part of that Internet of Things is like, um, at the moment, I use that wash solution until it stops working. Well, that's not very objective. That's just subjective. Or I use the wash solution a few times, then I throw it away. Well, that's not necessarily very um, environmentally friendly. So there is a better way of doing this. And so obviously, it's back to the point um, earlier on of ZP. We can take those kind of... Um, Solutions, take our technology stack, which is what we've done. We've put the sample onto the sensor. The app tells the sensor what to do. The sensor, the electronics gives the data back to the app and the app gives the data to Julie and Julie brings the data up to the cloud. Um, and for an IoT company, we could bring that data across using the API. But in this point, we actually kept the data on the cloud because there was no IoT company involved. There was just a company that wanted to know um, literally how much um, pyridate was in the solution and we were able to see that um, really with no issue. The nice thing about pyridate is um, it's very um, active and it's in quite high concentration in this particular application so we had no real problems um, detecting it. Slightly different question, um, somebody was asking about the detection of copper in environmental samples so this is again you know um, you know a water an environmental sample how much copper is in it. Um, later on, there'll be a question about heavy metals. So um, those guys might find this interesting as well. Copper is easily detected by electrochemical methods. Um, the key word here is not stripping voltammetry. So we are able to detect copper and we are able to both detect it and um, quantify it. No particular issue. Again, this sort of technology stack that we have is, we call it sense it all. Um, but we can take these sensors, we can put them in our meters, the apps will tell the meter what to do, the sample goes on the sensor, the data comes back to the app, the data goes up to Julie, and we can convert it. Um, it's one thing saying it, of course you also have to do it. So in Julie we could see the raw signal, and there we could kind of essentially see um, how the signal um, changed with concentration. So we saw the signal at 200 ppb, um, which is 0.2 ppm. Um, 0 0.8 ppm and also 1.5 um, pp ppm as um, as well. Sorry, 1.5 ppm. Um, so this kind of gave us a sense that actually, you know, we we clearly could see the signal at this 0 0.8 ppm, and we could also clearly see a signal, you know, when it was at things like 1.5 ppm. Um, so we think what um, we think if the more data we collect then the more certainty we can see this but we can see obviously that we can clearly see the signal at 800 ppm and we're struggling to see the signal at 200 ppm so our limit detection is somewhere above 200 ppm and below um, 800 ppm um, the more data we gather then the more certainty that we can do that it's also worth saying that at Zimmer Peacock because we have this technology stack 
um, we can generally sort of bring in a sample, do four hours of work on it, and see if we can see something. And in this case, um, the native sample, which is approximately 200 ppm, is we're really struggling to see it. But when we spike up, then we can see it. But I'm quite happy with our limit detection, especially considering um, this was just a quick experiment. It's an environmental sample, so it's a real sample. So those things taken, I'm quite happy with that result. Um, this is slightly different now. This is a design of experiment. So what I want to say on design of experiment is this. Um, at Zimmer and Peacock, we build and test a lot of biosensors. So when we test them, we test them with various concentrations. We get signal versus concentration. And there could be some metrics around that. Sensitivity is an important metric but also limit detection. In fact, we we're just talking about limit detection um, just now. Um, so limit detection is also um, an important um, parameter as well. So how to optimize, how to optimize these sensors is, is a question. Um, so, you know, we obviously build them up by layering um, molecules on top of each other, tethering things like antibodies, putting blocking agents in there. You know, whilst we do this, we do a lot of in-process um, in monitoring to make sure that everything's working okay. But the question I'm trying to ask here is, and obviously the hint was, you know, a DOE, a design of experiment, is how do you optimize the fabrication of a biosensor? Most of the time, people just do it kind of um, looking at the literature, getting the best results from the literature, which is great. You know, you should, that's what we do. Um, but um, there's also, once you've got those, once you've got things that's working, how do you optimize it to make it the best it can be? So for example, you know, if I was fabric, or if we were fabricating a immunosensor, we would put a coupling agent on there, and there might be three parameters that we play with, concentration, time, and temperature. Um, after we've got the coupling agent on there, we might then put the antibody on there, and there might be three parameters that we play with, concentration, time, and temperature. Um, and then we might put a blocking agent down to stop what's called non-specific binding, and there we might play with concentration, time, and temperature. I'm just showing you that, in fact, you know, there's generally sort of three parameters that we're playing with, and how do you optimize? For each one of these steps, you might want to optimize those parameters, you know. A designer experiment is a good way of um, optimizing um, parameters. So I have concentrations, you know, I can have low and high, I can have temperature, when I say low and high, for example, um, 5 micrograms per milliliter and 20 micrograms per milliliter. Temperature, 0, for example, or 20 degrees. Um, time, 1 hour for incubation or 4 hours for incubation. But the most efficient way of actually saying, you know, which combination of parameters, or one of the most efficient ways of finding out which combination of parameters gives me, in the end, the best limit detection. So if my key... If my KPI, my key performance indicator, is limit detection, then how, how do I combine these parameters in order to give me the best limit detection? And that's where DOE comes in. DOE can actually map out the entire sort of experimental volume in this case, um, so that you actually, rather than you sort of staggering around trying to find it, the DOE is one of the most efficient ways of doing it. So what I'm going to do now is slightly um, change my screen a little bit and just jump in in fact what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump into um, first of all Julie so I've mentioned Julie a few times um, for those guys who are working in the IoT world it's probably worth knowing that Julie exists um, it does have an API um, strategy built into it so there's a whole thing about um, API here just so you know it's for real we do have some add-ons Julie starting to become a toolbox Especially for people um, in the biosensor world, so you can um, look at add-ons. We have a design of experiment. So what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to optimize something. So I will go uh, optimization, and I will. At the moment, we only have full factorial. So I said that there were just a few um, variables um, that we were um, super interested in, and um, at the moment. First variable I'm going to do is concentration. Um, the other one I think is um, useful is temperature. 
temperature and then time right add variable so i've added those um variables in and the next thing i need to do is put in some um, parameters for them so i will yeah, i am making these numbers up but i'll sort of pretend that i'm looking at five micrograms um per mil or up to 20 micrograms per mil and um, the temperature i mean this is something that we do do you know sometimes we do things at zero sometimes we do things at room temperature you know and time we like to be as quick as possible by the way but sometimes things take time um, so maybe try one hour and four hours it's, i don't really like four hours it's it's a bit much um you know why because we're a contract developer contract manufacturer you need to do things time efficiently um and then i will go next um so what it's now going to do is actually going to calculate me um, a table of experiments so it's really useful because it's basically um it's saying okay um what it's going to express it's going to give me a table of experiments which i should then effectively go off and do um and then i just bring the results back and by the way if you want to kind of go off now you can basically copy the um you can copy a link to this and then come back to it later on so don't worry about that because now it's generated the list of experiments so the first experiment says is do a concentration of five a temperature of zero time of one Second experiment, concentration of 20, temperature of zero, a time of one. Next one is 521. So you can see it's, it's listed out. Would it, you know, it's trying to calculate the most efficient way of um, exploring the experimental space or experimental volume um, in this particular case. Now I need to um, just put in some um, results. So let me just go back to... Um, Julie, which is here. Um, so let's have a quick look. So I'm making this up. Concentration of five, temperature of five, time of, um, and I'll say that that gave me a result, a limit of detection of seven. I'll say that gave me a limit of detection of eight. I'll say that gave me a limit of detection of, um, let's say one. That gave me a limit of detection of one. That gave me a limit detection. By the way, you know you can see, um, you can see that I'm obviously um, um, making this. I don't want to say making it up, but you know I, this is just an ex it's just a thought experiment. So I put seven for that, seven for that, um, two for example, and um, two. What I've what I've basically tended to do here is bias the results so that um, you know intuitively I would often think that. Um, High concentrations tend to make chemical reactions go quite well, and um, sometimes temperature can denature things. So I've tended to just sort of favor high concentrations and um, favor the lower temperature. You know, you have to put in what you really get. By the way, that's an, that. Those are the results of your experiment. You can't essentially make them up like I am there. But uh, hopefully, you um, you understand the point. Um, I go next. This is the real good thing now because now it goes off and actually looks at your results and gives you essentially a predictive equation and sort of says, you know, um, so if I come in now and I sort of make some, you know, assessment that I'm going to do um, something at a concentration of five and a temperature of 15, see if it does this actually, 15 and a time of 1.5. I need to put in a value between um, two it predicts me what my limit of detection is, for example, in that in that particular um, scenario. So if I have a target of seven and a tolerance of one, this is great. It will, this is really great. This will actually give you a whole host of experiments that will try and get you close to your target. So I think that's so powerful because um, you will especially you know in academia you read papers you'll sort of get your best conditions you'll do it if it works you're done in industry you do have to sometimes optimize things so you can do this will allow you to explore per, um, the parameters that you think are most important it will tell you what experiments to do you put the results of the experiments back in um, it will then give you a predictive equation 
You can even tell it what you want to achieve and it will give you conditions that it thinks are the best for you, which I think is really um, interesting. In fact, you know, I can look at this and it makes a bit of sense to me, you know, you know that um, if I go low in concentration, it might tell me to increase with time. You know, for example, if I go high in concentration, it tells me to decrease in time. So it's intuitive, but it just takes a skill set that you might not. And people, and I asked people yesterday, in fact, in a workshop, how they did this. They, they said, oh, I did it by hand. Wow. You know, but actually we can just do it so quickly. Anyway, so I'm really pleased with that. That's a function of Julie. Julie is an extremely comprehensive, very powerful um, database. It's got an API function and it's also got a ability now not just to upload data, analyze data, share data, share it using the API, but it's also got these add-ons as well. Now I will go back to um, essentially my um, original. So we ran through those slides. Question number seven, somebody wants to make a sensor um, and they're asking whether our sensor has mercury. The first thing to say is the sensors that we set, our um, heavy metal sensors that we sell on the website, we only sell them um, to work with our electrodes, so we won't support them in any way on the um, on other people's software like palm sensors, etc. If you want to develop your own heavy metal sensor, then go to ZP, get one of our carbon electrodes, and start doing the essentially doing the research around um, heavy metal detection using anodic stripping voltammetry. So I don't mind saying that. Um, if you are using a Sensit Smart from ZP, sorry, from Palm Sense, Sensit Smart's a very small USB potential. Start. I just want to say that um, it works pretty well with our um, screen printed electrodes because we have a, um, a silver silver chloride counter electrode which really helps with what's called the compliance voltage. But that's a side note. But the quick answer is um, the metal detection sensors that we make and manufacture in our ISO 13485 facility. Um, we only support them our own electronics. If you want to do your own R&D work, um, go and take a look at the ZP's hypervalue electrodes. If you're using PalmSense potential stats, um, there's a connector out there. I have to say it very clearly. We have a connector on our website. There'll be a link in a minute. You need the seven millimeter connector for two millimeter banana plugs. So the banana plugs coming with lots of palm sense potential stats um, are two millimeters. So the electrode that I'm suggesting you use is seven millimeters wide. So you need a seven millimeter wide adapter for a two millimeter banana plug. Um, but I have put the links um, here. So now um, it's been quite a long session. Electronics for hydroponics. We really only support our own electronics. Um, I think with this one, we have looked at your electronics. There's, we can't, you don't see a, a glaring problem, but there is a problem that um, the counter electrodes getting oxidized. It, you know, either way, it shouldn't be getting oxidized. And according to your description, you're not using it. So it's, it, it's in circuit when it's not in circuit. Um, we have put a link to that Arduino. We don't support that Arduino uh, board, but you know, or circuit, but take a look at it. Um, Building a potential stat, we do put, you know, probably the most comprehensive list of um, materials out there on um, potential stats. Um, so, you know, you, you have to kind of go there. For IoT companies and software companies, ZP's policy is sensor to API. So it really suits most software companies, as, you know, with cloud solutions because they can call upon our technology stack. Um, something like a micro project is a good place to start. Obviously, you know, the platform's very versatile, so we're able to detect things like periodate and copper. I really play this design of experiment, both to my industrial colleagues and my academic colleagues. Like, if you want to optimize something, and to my academic colleagues, many of you do this kind of chemistry, concentration, temperature, and time are the three parameters you play with. And so a DOE that you can access through Julie is a great way. And then the heavy metal detection, if you Want to use palm sense potential stats, then use that screen printed electrode, the hypervalue screen printed electrode. Make sure you get that connector, which has the seven millimeter slot with for two millimeter banana plugs. And I think that's it. Thank you very much. So first of all, apologies from me that this wasn't live. I literally I've got a terrible internet connection here. It's five megabytes per second. So I can upload 
if anyone, no, many, many people remember floppy disks, but I can up upload about five floppy disks in a, in a second. There's just nothing these days. All right. So thank you very much um, for attending. If you have any questions, we'll do this again next Thursday, 8 a.m. London time. And I wish you all um, happy rest of the week and a happy weekend as well. Okay. Thanks very much.